Dear Mr. Donfried, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me on such a, talking about such an important issue like the refugee crisis. It's called the refugee crisis. It's a refugee situation here in Europe. Uh, in fact, it's uh, the uh, issue which dominates the press. And uh, where a lot of, uh, yes, which changes also the discussion about the political landscape. So let me talk uh, first of all about uh, some uh, facts, some numbers of uh, the refugee situation. Actually, the UNHCR has, uh, yes, uh, has uh, sees that there are 60 million refugees around the world. Uh, we talk about uh, a little bit of smaller numbers here in Europe small if we see, if we talk about the rest of the world, but we are focusing now of one million refugees here in Europe. Um, it's a challenge for Europe. We see it a little bit as a challenge for Germany because we picked up quite a large number of refugees here. Uh, we were talking about the relocation, not about the relocation, about the distribution of refugees here uh, in Europe. We were talking about the number of 160,000. Until now, uh, in Europe, 160 are distributed. So you see there is kind of dispute among the European member states in terms of uh, uh, distributing refugees. But I think you're all aware of the situation. So what's uh, the effect, uh, first, of this discussion? We haven't solved the problem yet, but what is the effect on the European society about, uh, uh, on the political level? Uh, everybody, uh, I think, took note how the extreme right parties develop uh, in Europe. And uh, focusing also on the, 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 the this, uh, uh, election situation in France, you see that uh, the far right, uh, the Front National, has gained uh, enormous power. Uh, talking about Germany, we have an equivalent. It's the AFD, we call it an equivalent. They don't like to hear that, but that's the fact. They have the same thematic issues. They're over 10% estimated in the polls for the upcoming elections. So, uh, what causes refugees? And I think this is a question we have to focus on. Why do people leave their areas? Why do they leave their country? And I think the question, from my perspective, is quite simple. The economic reasons, and uh, when we talk about economic reasons, we have to point that out quite clear. Mostly, it refers on bad governance. And uh, when we talk about bad governance, how can we talk about uh, bad governance in a more concrete sense? Bad governance, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for me is a lack of inclusion of the majority of the population living in a country, living in an area. And uh, when we focus on the Syria crisis, which uh, was pointed out just uh, at your uh, beginning uh, remarks, uh, Mr. Donfried, it's the same situation. You had an elite <clears throat> uh, which was uh, sharing the cake let's uh, put it that uh, in, in concrete words, which were sharing most of the, the capital of the country. Uh, I say sharing the cake, this is a term which is used uh, sometimes in, in so-called third world countries, because the capital is not distributed. It means also what comes into the uh, national budget there is no plan for the budget. That means there is no trickle-down effect. There is no concept for an economic development. It means the political elite doesn't share the capital. Uh, a lot of third world countries and uh, 
a lot of third world countries have an economy as well, which is not uh, very well diversified. That means they sell resources, and selling resources is not, uh, how can I say, it doesn't create employment. And uh, when we talk about inclusion and participation, it means to bring people to work. It doesn't mean just to make money on the overall level and bringing money and uh, having a capital transfer due to uh, the sales of resources to a country, you also have to do something with it. So, um, focusing on that issue and, uh, and uh, the development of those, uh, of those countries, mostly there is no development or there is a state of stagnation over a long period of time where young people especially feel disillusionized and uh, therefore there as well. And this is the next issue open for different uh, uh, and more radical models of an economy and of a society. Um, so uh, to make that clear, this lack of a vision, how to run a government and to run a nation, it causes uh, in general, and in most, of, uh, the, uh, in most of the examples, it causes poverty. And um, in my personal experience, when I talk uh, to people which are non-governmental uh, participants, also people from the civil society, and to ordinary people, just uh, for example, if I visit Africa, like uh, Mr. Donfried said, I have a Senegalese background, talk to people. And I say, so what's your plan for your future? They said, Charles, there is no plan, but yalla barna. This is a wall of word, a wall of uh, uh, idiomatic expression. This means God is great. So why is God great? Of course, God is great. But uh, the thing is, if you have no, uh, no vision, if you have no possibility, if you don't see any chances to improve your life, so what do you believe in? The thing is, you don't want to stop existing from that moment where you, you see there is no future. You have to have a perspective. And if the perspective is not based on an economic, personal economic improvement or development, you turn into somebody, in my opinion, who is over-religious because it's the only option. So, um, integration here of people who come from different societies, from, uh, yes, let's say from different cultures in an institutionalized and well-ordered economy in terms of, uh, how can I say, in terms of uh, an organized society, it's a big challenge. If, uh, for example, you grow up in a so-called economic shadow economy. It means shadow economy, you don't know which brings, what brings you from A to B. It means if you don't know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, you're not gonna get a job. So your approach on handling your life is different. It means you have to make, you have to have a family who is in charge or something like that, who knows some people who share, who can distribute the small amount of jobs available. And that's the first thing. I mean, it's about jobs. And if you have work, if you have something to do, you are different. You are not a philosopher. And, and a religious philosopher or, or it's just another philosophy. You have, first of all, you have to handle your life. You have your obligations, and you also have your, your possibilities to improve. Uh, if you come now uh, to Europe and have, you have a different kind of thinking, people who think different, people who think 
more in terms of when I go from A to B, which institution I call or I contact. If I'm unemployed, if I have a problem with my health, and uh, if I say I want to, to continue to uh, develop myself on the intellectual level, you know all that, you have this option. But uh, the thing is, um, from the beginning of your childhood, your approach on life is different. And the challenge is, if people from outside come here to uh, Europe to adapt, to adapt to uh, the thinking and the mindsetting of the people here, and uh, not to say, I come here and I improve just this sector, which in my opinion is the most important, this is the economic side, it's also the cultural side. And I think that's where the problem starts if you are confronted with the people from here, if you say two different cultures meet. So what do they talk about? Um, religion. Uh, religion, I have to say, Europe, Germany as well as religious, we have Protestants, Catholics, Jews, we have also Muslims. But uh, uh, in a secular society, especially in Germany, you know, we don't talk that much about religion because our mindset and also our ethic ambition is also created by philosophy. It's, called, it's based on uh, the, the ancient uh, Greek philosophy. And uh, I think this uh, philosophy, this freedom of outside of religion, thinking about moral ethics and, and, and social, uh, social relationships and a social developing a, a, a socially attractive society, it does not come necessarily from religion, even if it's interlinked to religion, but not in the institutional sense. Um, when I say, how do I, how, how I would integrate myself into society, I'm obviously of dark color, but I grew up here. Okay, so I don't have to, this is an advantage. I don't have to ask how the Germans are, I represent uh, uh, the Hessen uh, uh, region, born in Bavaria. Uh, nobody has to explain me. Uh, also the German cultural diversity when it comes to regional issues. Uh, I think uh, the discussion is uh, also about how far, what is integration? What is it? How is it? How are you uh, uh, accepted as an integrated uh, person? And uh, also the discussion is always about assimilation, how far, and especially when it goes to religion, do I assimilate the German or the European society? Regarding uh, to France, uh, I think you have a large number of Muslim uh, people, but the issue in France was not the religion. Religion came after. I think it was a lack of integration and a lack of opportunities to a certain extent from, uh, for, for people with a migrant background. Uh, and when we talk about uh, integration, assimilation and all that, and I think uh, both sides have to commit themselves to the process and to the will of integration. Because integration is also a matter of will. It's not just a duty. And uh, it's not about saying, and if uh, people ask me, say, yeah, uh, Charles, what do you do for Africa? I said, of course, you know, I do something for Africa. I'm the Committee of Development Strategies. I said, but I'm voted in Germany. Uh, I cannot start uh, my uh, election campaign and can say, look, uh, I do something for Africa. You know, vote me because I do uh, something good for Africa. I have to say, 
I do something good for Germany. And uh, if I give, or if I sh should give, a young refugee or uh, a young migrant uh, an advice, I would say try to see Germany a little bit, or Europe, or a European country, uh, with the eyes of the local autochthon population. And uh, if I would give an advice for the autochthon population, I would say give a refugee, a migrant, a chance to see and to integrate in your society on all levels. Don't stop him somewhere as a housemate, as in the Chambre de Bonne in Paris, or somewhere in distributing pizza. Integrate him in the education process, and that was the issue of my four speaker. Very important is not to get access first to money, it's getting access to education to satisfy also your intellectual potential. And most of people which come from a complicated economic environment are very creative. And they have to see that as a big chance as well to get and use this uh, creativity in getting intellectual capacity. Um, so uh, I think we have to speak about opportunities, about challenges at one side, but as well as opportunities for both means for the migrants, the refugees, as well as for the society. And uh, making a comparison to the uh, U.S. society, in, uh, in the U.S., they take the best. They take those who are the most talented, and it doesn't matter where you're from. And uh, I think as America is as well is uh, a composition of diverse, uh, uh, very heterogenic on the ethnic side, and I, I think there is a different vision of the society. We here in Europe, of course, we conserve tradition. We conserve tradition and it's cozy tradition. I like the lower Bavarian tradition. I grew up at the countryside. I like the food. I like when I sit together with people who speak the same dialect. I feel at home with the dialect and I think identity is as well dialect. Right? If I speak my dialect, I'm a different kind of person. Uh, but uh, we're in a period of globalization, and we ourselves called globalization, and globalization first be determined as an economic process. But it's not just an economic process. We are talking about human capital. We are talking about human capital. Francis Fukuyama was talking about human capital. Human capital is something you cannot neglect. A human being exists. We are not just uh, anonymous participants of the world economy, everybody has character and an identity. So, um, there must be, in spite of all that coziness, what we feel when we talk about tradition. And it also refers, it refers also to the migrants and the refugees who come. Don't conserve so much that what happened to you in the past. And they say, okay, I'm, I come now to Europe, I miss my culture. That's not the approach. You made the decision to come here and say, okay, I also improve my situation, not only from the economic side, I widen my scope about the world. And I think this is one of 
the keywords and maybe also my final conclusion on that topic, how to integrate refugees and how the integration of migrants should work here in Europe. Open your mind. Learn something new. Don't just say, I make more money than at home and I continue like I did before. Learn something new. And uh, if I would drop a word to the society here, to the people here and uh, who see that there's something going on in the neighborhood, you see people with the rucksack looking different, talking different languages and, and, and something, learn something as well. Be open-minded. It's good that you, 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 you feel at home, you have your, your, your dialect, you have your issues, and you have the same opinion about a, a lot of things. But the, the world has become smaller. It, doesn't become, it hasn't become bigger. It has become smaller. And I think we have to find together to have a common approach on global challenges. If this is on climate, if this, it is about participation, if it's about economic development, if it's about uh, European solidarization, the world is one and we have to treat the world with a common approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hubert. We'd be very pleased now to take some questions and comments. Uh, okay, let's start maybe ladies first here in the front. Many questions. So uh, as always, Mr. Hubert, very popular. So let's take maybe a group of them if we can, because uh, we do have some time limitations, maybe four or five, and then I'll give you the chance to respond. And if you could also introduce yourself, please. Um, hi, my name is Emily van Rienen, and I am from the Netherlands, so I'm very well aware of the problem of uh, integrating refugees into European Can you society. speak a little bit louder, please? Uh, yes, of course. Thank is that you. better? Okay. Um, so you previously said that bad government is a lack of including people into society. But isn't that what is currently going on in Germany as the refugees are not really introduced into German society, rather kept in certain places? And what do you think Germany could do in terms of cultural diplomacy to integrate these refugees into German or European society. Thank you. First of all, we have to give them a place to stay. And first of all, we have to handle, let's put it this way, the refugee crisis in terms of providing them with uh, houses, you know, with food, with uh, medical care and all that. I think this is the phase number one. What you're talking about is phase number two, to integrate people. And uh, of course, this is uh, also a structural challenge, a logistic challenge and all that. And, uh, uh, and I think, like I was talking about the wool before, we have to talk to the refugees about the uh, possibilities which are, uh, uh, yeah, which they have in our in our society in terms of improving uh, the intellectual, uh, the economic uh, situation, but it's also about the cultural integration, and I think uh, we also have to talk about that. And the problem is that. Uh, in Germany, due to the, the history of Germany, a lot of people don't allow themselves to talk about that. They said, you know, also you are here in Germany now. What are the obligations from you? You know, it's the law side. Now, if you talk about religion, we have here, it's not religion. And I was visiting a refugee camp a couple of months ago in my constituency. I said, look, have a look also on, uh, uh, on, our, on our society. Have a look how we think, how things work over here, and don't say, okay, things work over here, but I transfer it you know, and transform it to my individual strategy, and a, a singular strategy on how to make money. 
Uh, it's not all about money, and I think we have also to speak about, you know, uh, uh, how can I say, about the social dialogue. And I think this is the big challenge, because if you have the social dialogue, if you can speak to people, if you speak the language, if you know how they think, feel, and act, you know, uh, uh, to integrate people in the labor market, it's a lot easier. And that's what I tell them. And I think this is the key issue. Don't say, I come from Syria, I come from there, and, and now I, I want to be a Syrian in a different environment, and uh, my uh, ambition is to make money, and that's it. People, you know, you have neighbors, you have people you talk to, they may not like that. It's also a commitment to the cultural values of a society. But I think this is going to be the challenge, and we have to, to have a focus on that. But it's a big challenge, because the number is quite big. We have a million of people here in Germany, a million of refugees. It means we have a population of 83 million of, uh, of people. To integrate one million of refugees, I think it's, uh, it's a challenge. And we have to see, you know, how that works. Uh, thank you. My name is Salani Gambule from Botswana. Um, I've realized that uh, European countries seem to be romanticizing the um, Arabic migrants. They've opened doors and borders, social services, as opposed to uh, African migrants that have been trolling and coming to European countries. They've been mistreated in countries like, you know, um, in, in Italy, France, maybe. But I wonder why is that uh, Europe has opened doors for these um, Arabic migrants as opposed to uh, African migrants. Possibly um, why the double standards, if there seems to be some. And also I've realized that, uh, that's my second question, the migrants that have come to Europe, they seem to be treated better in terms of social services than the locals. And in some circles, there have been uh, questions. Would this, in the long run, cause tensions between the locals and the, and the migrants? Final question is, uh, what has your government, the German government, done particularly for the African migrants? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, uh, would I answer to your question? You know, when you said that the African migrants are less welcome than the, uh, the, the Arab migrants. It's not true. The situation is why, what is, how can you achieve the status of, an of, uh, of a refugee? It's also about the question, what is an economic refugee and a refugee who comes from a crisis region? And if you want to achieve the status of a refugee here, you have to come from a crisis region to be accepted. And not to say, I come from somewhere where my government doesn't achieve to put me on the labor market. But the economics, if it's the fault from the, the, the political uh, uh, res uh, responsibles or not, now I want to improve you know, my living conditions. This is not a reason due to the Geneva Convention. There is a law about the, the status of a refugee. And that's why you say, why uh, if somebody, I have this discussion, for example, when I'm in Senegal, I have a house in Senegal, I speak to the youngsters, they say, yeah, how many of you would like to go to Europe? And they say, yeah, uh, Charles asked the question the other way around, how many of us would like to stay here? But be, nobody wants to stay. And so uh, that's the situation. The situation is, it's uh, them, I said, but you have to eat. In, in, in our perception, you know, in Africa, people have nothing to eat. But everybody has uh, something to eat over there. They're all quite healthy. They do sports with me. But I said, look, uh, they said, but Charles, you know, you have a different lifestyle over there. I said, yep, it doesn't help. And now tell, you know, do something for your, your country. Elect the right people. But, you know, when we pick up, you know, the population of Africa, if we send a sign 
to Africa. Everybody will come. So the thing is, it's not that uh, the, the Africans are less welcome than the Arabs. It's just not true. And I have just to put it in a clear, in a clear uh, juridical uh, position. You have to have, uh, due to the Geneva Convention, the status of a refugee to come here. It got nothing, and I speak it out, to do with racism, with, uh, let you say, we prefer the, the more whites to the less whites. That's not the case. I'm less white than an Arab, and I'm in German parliament for a conservative party. Uh, treating the locals <clears throat> less, uh, how can I say, or worse uh, even uh, than those who just arrived. I have to answer you the question in the same manner. Those who arrive, they come from a crisis area. And they experienced uh, a lot of, uh, of bad things. First of all, before they left. Second, the, most of them walked here. Then they had the, the situation also of, uh, uh, of human traffickers. And let me tell you a story about, uh, about uh, a young man from Syria I was talking to recently. He said, you know, I started in Syria, you know, with five people. But before I went to jail twice, you know, from the regular, inverted commas, Syrian army, I was in prison twice. He didn't talk what happened to him when he was in prison. He said, and then the, uh, he came out, and uh, uh, ISIS visited his home. And they said, why aren't you with us? He said, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't know how to contact you. And they said, and he, because he was afraid. The next day, he left, and he left with five people. He said, on the way to Turkey, there were snipers on some corners. I looked around, it made ping, and the other one next to me was shot in the head, and at the end, three of us were arriving. We went to Turkey. They are our brothers, but of course, you know, not everybody is a politician. There are different people all around the world, good and bad. They said they, uh, they gave us work. They said 200 euro uh, a month or a week, I don't remember. They said at the end, we got nothing. And they said, what do you want? You're nobody. Then uh, we approached, or some traffickers approached us. They gave us, they, they, they asked us for 1,000 euro to, to go to Greece. And then we came to the, to, the sea, to the seaside. They put us on a boat and they said, you go by yourself. And they were heavily armed. We couldn't do anything. So a situation, if you compare that to people who came here, you say that the people who are already here, uh, of course, we expect more integration from people who are here. Yes, uh, and, and, and the other ones, you know, we, uh, I think we have to protect them, first of all. And we have to treat them. Uh, we have to, uh, to teach them the language. But uh, a situation, what made the situation complicated, and I have to speak that out clearly, was the discussion before about religion. And uh, we had the, uh, 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 the discussion on religion before. Yeah, we had uh, the discussion on terrorism also before. You know, I don't want, don't get me wrong, I don't want to, excuse, to, to, to say, uh, you know, to, accu uh, to, to accuse everybody who was here before as somebody who is a radical. But I just talk about the public opinion and about the public sentiment of people. And then if you say, you know, uh, for me, it's, uh, I prefer the Christians. Uh, the other ones say, I prefer the, 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 the Muslim religion. So there was already a discussion, vital discussion in the society about religion. And like I said, you know, we are not preferred for us, for that. We don't think uh, so much about religion. And it doesn't influence our lifestyle. Religion. We may go to church sometimes, may pray sometimes, sometimes not, and that's it. And so that was a vital discussion uh, within the society before the refugee crisis appeared. And so uh, people 
how can I say, they look at each other with different eyes when the discussion comes on religion. And that's why I don't think that uh, uh, people, uh, in spite of uh, this situation, are, are treated bad over here. I think uh, you have the, uh, how can I say, you have all the opportunities, you have no institutional discrimination. And let's put it this way, if you feel from certain individuals something like you may feel uh, or detect as racism. Racism is a global phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. I don't want to uh, speak about it that say, oh, there is no racism. There is racism all over the world. You know, if you go to Africa, if you go to Arab countries, you go to Asia, you know, I can accuse everybody in the world of racism. It happens on the individual level. And the most important uh, thing is that what, uh, from the political side, we can do, you know, is just that we don't, or, uh, or how, how can I say, we have a great awareness of that, that institutional racism may not happen. And this doesn't happen over here. And the rest is on the individual and the base of the individual understanding of folks and cultures. And everybody has to make his contribution to that. And let me be quite open about that. If you come to somewhere, where you're a stranger at the beginning. The thing is, uh, you have to prove that you also understand the society here. Don't go anywhere in the world, no matter where it is, and say, you have to understand me. This is my personal approach. You have to go and understand the people first. And not expect, you know, you have to understand me. I have a different religion. I have a different opinion about life. Nobody will like you. This is my personal statement. And no matter where you go and in which direction, if I go the other direction, I say, look, I'm a German. You have to understand me as a German. Uh, you think people are going to be happy? Nobody will be happy. And the last question, maybe, you know, as I always try to, uh, to exp uh, explain or to answer in quite a lot of, uh, in a very detailed uh, form, maybe we pick up somebody else, I'll ask it. I think I answered you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Huber. Unfortunately, we are over time, but I didn't want to cut you there. You were giving yeah. such an, an excellent and I think a very thoughtful uh, answer to those, those questions. Uh, we are out of time and our, our next two speakers are under some time pressure as well. So we do need to go on, but really thank you so much uh, for the keynote address, also for at least the brief discussion and exchanges that followed. And I'd like to ask everyone to please join in expressing our sincere gratitude to Mr. Charles Huber.